So the Global Health Catalyst Program is a program at Dana Faber, Brigham, and Harvard Medical School Cross Institutional. And uh, the goal of that is really collaboration. So basically, you know, collaborating between low and in middle income countries and also high income countries like United States and Europe, European countries like Germany and all of that. And uh, we kind of started from the idea of cancer, so bridging cancer disparities, so collaborating to uh, reduce cancer disparities. And, um, and so the concept comes from the fact that if you are born with cancer in some in Cameroon or Tanzania or some low and middle income country, then what happens is that you don't have access to treatment, right? But if you are born just down the street here, uh, you have multiple options. So you can either go to Brigham, you can go to Dana Farber, you can go to Beth Israel, you can go to all these different institutions and you get world class care, right? So just this disparity where it's no fault of your own, where you're just born somewhere and you don't have access to treatment. So how can we collaborate, you know, to, to eliminate this disparity? So that's the goal of uh, the program itself. And so over the years, we kind of started 2015. Um, it was mostly cancer health professionals that met, you know, the president of the Union for International Cancer Control, the IAEA, some really big people, aortic, you know, African Organization for Research and Training in Cancer. And uh, we kind of thought about how can we reduce these disparities? How can we collaborate to make that better? Um, and so we started talking to each other. One outcome that came from that is that uh, we can focus on information and communication technologies uh, because it kind of bridges these geographic barriers. People have time. A lot of people had time. They wanted to help, but they don't have time to, uh, they want to help, but they don't have time to travel to those developing countries to do anything. So if you imagine you're sitting here, you have to go 4,000 miles in order to do that. So what if you could pull that time? If these people just had 30 minutes a week or one hour uh, in a month, uh, if you can pull each person's time, you have one hour, I have one hour, another person has one hour, and you can create this infrastructure which allows them to do something cohesive to have an impact somewhere, that would be imp really powerful. And all you need there is just to have this information and communication technology infrastructure. You know, Africa, for example, leapfrogged the landlines. You know, I grew up in the village there where I didn't have a land phone. But now my mom used WhatsApp, you know, and they have mobile phones, it's like deep, deep penetration. So is there an opportunity there where you can use that kind of connectivity and actually close the disparities? Uh, so. Uh, so we started doing a number of things, and uh, two things resulted from that. One is, so, so the focus recommendation from that meeting, the first summit that we had, was that we should focus on information and communication technologies. Uh, so that's one thing. And the second thing we decided to focus on was engaging the diaspora. So the diaspora is li literally people like me who were born in some village in Cameroon or some other African country and who are now in the United States contributing to the healthcare of the country here. But um, you would say that's a problem, it's a brain drain. You know, I'm not helping the country in which I was born, right? So, but we, this diaspora people, have a good appreciation of the problems on the ground and appreciation of the problems here in the United States, right? They understand the both cultures. And then secondly, you know, it's not, and I really got inspired partly because you have a lot of people here in, from Europe and from America coming to Africa to help, you know, administer healthcare. Um, but, you know, and it's great, but they inspire the people, who, me, I cannot just sit here and just watch those people doing it, right? Actually, the people they are helping, those are my brothers and sisters. Right, so, so engaging the diaspora to give back. So we decided that we we're going to turn brain drain into global health gain, which means that you know we create that infrastructure like the ICT infrastructure, information and communication technology infrastructure, engage the diaspora so we can just sit here and have an impact there. And I can tell you three things that we've done that you know resulted from that. So one is this idea, and we talked about that yesterday. The Nafaba president talked about that. The fact that you can take the Dana Faber Harvard Cancer Center and put it in the cloud, right? So it means that it doesn't matter where you are. If you have a smartphone, you have a tablet, you have a computer, you can just log on, you can have access. Um, which means that patients, you can upload patient, patient data sets. If you have a diagnosis, you can upload 
PDF or whatever, the doctor can sit here and can look at that and say, here's my, here's my recommendation for you. Uh, so e-consultation, we started doing that. Chumo boards, so we have the diaspora groups actually in Germany, Campomedics is one of the leading partners that we have that hold these regular Chumo boards with their countries, um, making sure that the, the doctors, they are giving the best care um, to their patients. Um, and they look at also education and training. Uh, so we actually won an award last year for this, after launching the project last year at this summit. What we started implementing, we have trained, successfully trained over 100, uh, 200 professionals, oncologists in Africa, they, in very specific things that are making an impact. For example, if you have, uh, most of the doctors, they are moving from 2D to 3D, which means that they're not, they're getting 3D data sets. And now they have to use that to uh, find where the cancer is in those images. So you have to contour them, draw, and they didn't have that knowledge, right? So just training them allows them to deliver their care more effectively. And what we saw was uh, terrifying in two, was good and bad. The good part was that we saw a significant jump in the skill level. You know, take prostate cancer. Around your prostate, you have the bladder, you have the rectum, you have. So if you're going to shoot radiation therapy to the prostate that has cancer, you want to also not have the bladder and the rectum having radiation. So what a doctor would do is has to go in there and contour. So basically, draw circles around what in the CT data set. What is your prostate? What is your rectum? And then plan a treatment delivery where you shoot the X-ray such that they only maximize the dose of the prostate. If you don't know what the rectum and the prostate is on the CT data set, you cannot even begin the treatment planning, okay? So what that really means then is that we trained people just to recognize that there was a jump in skill set. We realized people who took a, a test before and then after the training were able to actually identify and do all that contouring much, much better. So the good part was there was a jump in skill level uh, the other part that was shocking for me personally was that, so it means that all the patients have been seeing until then, you know, what, what was happening to them, right? So some patients have been suffering because they didn't have that skill level. I can really blame them because that's the education they had. Um, so, but that, that training actually happened very collaboratively. So you had the best professors here at Harvard, from UPenn, from, uh, from MD Anderson, from, from Heidelberg, from Oxford University, David Kerr, and all those people, they give lectures. So if you do that collaboratively for them, it's just one hour, you know, apart from their busy schedule. But they are training somebody there that's having a really big impact. Right? So that's the cloud. What really means the cloud is you don't have to travel. You know, you can just, using information and communication technologies, you can do that. Um, so now we actually had uh, this past week partnership. With, we just had the session today uh, with IBM, looking at how you know, they are doing a lot with the cloud, how we can partner in this. Um, so yeah, we're very excited about the potential impact of this. Uh, yesterday, Professor El Zawawi talked about you know, launching the Global Oncology University, where you know, we can actually give these courses, all these specialists can give the courses, um, pulling their time together. And then we credential local sites in these different low and middle income countries, where we go there, see what infrastructure they have, and say, this is where you're going to do your practical training. You can take the classes online. But this center has enough infrastructure where if you go through the different components of the, this number of hours of training, we can certify that you've completed those degree requirements. And so you can have residents getting their residency. You can have people getting their master's degrees and PhDs. So I mean, there's a lot of short-term training that's useful, like what we did last year. But now we are making that longer term, where you can actually get a degree. You can get residency training. Uh, so we're very excited about And that's going to be collaborative teaching. So you're still going to be getting the best experts. Professor Kerr from Oxford. You're going to have Professor Starmark from, uh, from Heidelberg. You're going to have Professor Ezawawi from Egypt. You're going to have somebody in MD Anderson. From, you know, and we're very excited about this. And so we actually mentioned that yesterday. Um, so many people already si signed up on the platform. Uh, so um, you know, I didn't even realize that. I was just sharing that today. When I looked at that, I saw that so many people already shared. Just to show you how many people resonate with the concept. Uh, and obviously, we are looking to see how we can partner with eCancer as well, because you have tons of really great videos that can actually be used. You actually are the pioneers of this kind of education and training. Uh, so yeah, so we really look forward to seeing how we can collaborate in this area. Uh, so that's one, one thing we're excited about.
So yeah, so I've talked a little bit about the education component, uh, but the cancer center in the cloud, comprehensive cancer center in the cloud, is really comprehensive because we have both education, research, and care. So the research part is what I, I also do, all of my research falls under that. Uh, and the reason for that is this. So we have uh, a lot of possibilities here where you know you can actually do low research in a low and middle income country that is beneficial also for uh, high income countries. Um, and so in 2015, you know, I won the Bright Futures Prize here at Harvard, which is really based on developing tiny drones uh, that you can use to target cancer. It precisely delivers the drugs to the cancer cells without the side effects that you get. Uh, from chemo. When you see somebody with chemo, you know, obviously there are those side effects. Uh, but what was really cool about it is that it can train your immune system uh, to actually recognize the cancer. So part of my talk yesterday was showing how you can actually take that technology and bring it to a low resource setting where you can give, the title of the talk was cancer treatment, curative cancer treatment for less than $300. If you think about that, that's a big access issue. Remember I talked about global health disparities? One of the things even here in the United States is that when you are diagnosed with cancer, you have to ask yourself, should I see the uh, a cancer specialist first or should I see my financial specialist? Because the money, the cost is really high. I mean, obviously $150,000 or so reading somewhere. You know? So many populations even here in the United States have to go to Mexico, they have to go to India to get access to treatment if they don't have health insurance. Um, and that's a difficult issue. Uh, that's even worse in developing countries. Cameroon where I was born. You know, I grew up in the village walking barefooted. You know, so even talking to you here is a miracle. Uh, so if you don't bring the cost down to those people, right? So the, so the Bright Futures Prize is really interesting in the sense that, um, so Harvard set it up in three levels. So one, you have a great idea that they like. So it was peer reviewed, reviewers selected it, and then said they select the top six projects, and then you do kind of a shark tank. So you you know, they get the best, the deans and all those people that sit here and they present your project and they look at it and say, and question you. And then they t take the three best projects and then they put it out to the public and then they say, okay, which of these projects, they're equally worthy of winning this prize? Which of these projects do you want to, I and mean, they had similar models today, do you want to support? So a lot of people voted, not only in the, all 50 states in the United States from Europe, but also a lot of them from Africa. The people who voted from Africa said, is this one of those technologies that you're going to develop that's only going to benefit the United States? Why should I vote for this if it's never going to come to me? And at that point, we made a commitment that it doesn't matter what, we're going to make sure that it's accessible. So we've actually, it's a patented technology by Dana Faber and Brigham, uh, but and we have options to license that, right? But we decided that instead of licensing it, we're going to make sure that we develop it ourselves and we just got funding from the NIH, $4 million to kind of do some of this. So, you know, you license, you do that so that people can have access to it because you can give that to a company, they may decide to do whatever they like with it, which, you know. So uh, we're very excited about that because that really fits into the global health thing. And so we're planning a clinical trial and one of them would be probably with Professor Kerr in Oxford. He's kind of talking about the idea yesterday about Afrox H, which is, he already has Afrox, which is Africa Oxford. And now he wants to add an H to it, which is Africa, of Oxford, Harvard, uh, where we'll make these multi center clinical trials. Uh, so people in different regions in these countries can have access to the same clinical trial that we're having here at Harvard. Um, and that's one of the clinical trials we're very excited about. My colleague Paul Nguyen talked about it yesterday. He's driving that for prostate cancer. Uh, we also have some really good data already for pancreatic and lung cancer. Uh, so that's a technology that, um, really falls under the global health catalyst kind of thing. Some other people have talked about it here today. They have AI that can contour, you know, things like that. You know, those are things we want to include in the platform of global health. It's ICT based. It's something that can bridge disparities, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, so overall, you know, I mean, the research really, I'm excited about that. The fact that, you know, what we are doing can actually be made accessible to developing countries. Yeah, final message is just that, you know, I mean, the Global Health Catalyst Summit, we really thank you guys for being here. It's really about collaborations. And obviously, uh, Professor Eduardo uh, Kazab is one of the luminaries 
in global health. I don't even know what hat will, is best to fit him, right? Editor in chief now and for you guys, and also Danny and you guys are doing great. But the idea of collaboration is really the essence of this summit. And so we actually opened it up yesterday. The idea was that if you had one word you're taking out of here, is how can we collaborate? not trying to take away what you're doing. So you're really, really good at what you're doing, but let's find areas where we can synergize our efforts and go further. Um, you know, because if you go by yourself, you may go fast. That's what they say in Africa. You know, if you go together, you go further. Uh, you can still do what you're doing, but find areas where we can collaborate. And you know, for me, it's really looking forward to working with eCancer um, to see how, you know, with these partnerships already built, we can collaborate to go forward.